All right. So we're going to get started. All right. And here's two more people joining. I'll make sure they get in as well. And then, of course, um, we will make sure that everybody gets the recording. So we'll be sending that out tomorrow as well uh, for everybody to take a look. Yeah, thanks uh, to all of you for joining. Again, we're super excited. We had uh, more signups than our Zoom account allowed. So we had full capacity. So lots of people who expressed their interest, which is very interesting. Uh, we will be speaking a lot about honey production today. James will do uh, most of it. It's not just any production, it's actually sourwood uh, production for those who are not in Western North Carolina. And James will talk more about that. It's a specialty and varietal honey uh, that grows here in or is harvested here in Western North Carolina and a little bit in the surrounding states as well. Um, my name is Max. I'm the CEO of HiveTracks. I've been with HiveTracks for about two years now. And I kind of do the office part or like the co-working part while James is out there in the in the wild and takes care of that. And uh, me personally, I have more of a background uh, from the UN. So I was working uh, with beekeepers at the UN, mostly in South America and, and Africa uh, to understand like, you know, how can honey be yeah. harvested to increase smallholder livelihoods? And then I met James at one of the conferences of the UN, which has been a a great serendipitous event uh, it's, uh, over three years ago now. And since then we've been working together. So I would say, James, take it away and uh, walk us through what we're gonna be talking about today. All right. Well, short intro from me, uh, James Wilkes, founder of Hive Tracks. Uh, some of you I know well, um, thanks guys for, for being here. And uh, yeah, so I'm a university professor by day, uh, computer science is my area, PhD in computer science, been teaching for 31 years, actually just finished 31st year at Appalachian State. I uh, also have a small family farm business on the side, and that's where my beekeeping kind of got rooted, if you will, in the year 2000s when I started uh, and founded uh, Hive Tracks, released it in 2010, and been iterating on the combination of technology and, and bees since then. So, Today, we want to talk about honey production. You could say production, uh, but yeah, just honey and, and how that fits into the, the bee's life cycle and, and you as a beekeeper. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the context in which honey is, is made, what you need to do to get ready, when is the nectar flowing, how do you know, and then the end game that most of us enjoy is the harvesting of the honey. So, um, and then we'll have plenty of time for a Q&A. Uh, as you can see in my background, I'm here in my sourwood bee yard and actually Robert King's out there. Those are his hives right there. Uh, and so I just wanted to bring you, you know, to where the action is happening or we, we hope it's happening and uh, talk a little bit about it. at the end. I'll take you into one of the hives or, or just take a look at the yard so you can see what's going on here so let's get going max and yeah. by the way if you have questions along the way just type them in the chat and we'll either answer them now or later or you know we'll, we'll work them into the into the program as we go so exactly feel free to just drop them and i can then bring them up with james all righty let's go all right so honey bees as their name implies make honey uh they're they're really the only bee that uh creates substantial amounts of honey and that's just baked into their biology that's a good portion of the life of a honeybee colony is aimed at producing honey um and so from your spring buildup all of that's aiming towards a nectar flow or being able to produce honey okay on this slide you see i've got one of my sourwood honeys there uh, on display on the left, on the right. These are the variety of honeys that, that are made in our operation uh, throughout the year um, when we were able to separate out different flows, different varieties as we go. Now, this uh, presentation, while I'm a sideliner, my son is a sideliner and we have a bigger operation, we even move bees. You know, most of you are, are probably hobbyists and all the things that I'm talking about uh, apply there as well. There's just more work to it, if you will, if you're a sideliner. If you're if you are a you know hobbyist beekeeper, you're you're definitely constrained by time and place. And we'll talk more about that as we go. One of the big questions as a beekeeper that you might have is how much of this process 
can I control? All right, because it is agriculture and there are things that we can control like the weather, like the flora in your area. Um, you can impact it a little bit by planting things, but bees forage such a great area, it's hard to have a significant impact in that. So what I wanna talk about here is what you as a beekeeper can do. Our our goal really as a beekeeper, the bee, by the way, the bees are going to make honey if they can. That's the, if 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 you put them in the in the in the right context, they are going to make honey. There's nothing that you have to magically do to make them or coax them into making honey. They're going to do it. Um, and so, what can you do to help with that process? All right. So that's kind of the the framework. Um, let's see what else. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Max. To the next one. We'll talk. Time and place. The honey that is made by a colony is completely defined by the time of year and the location of the colony of bees, right? So honey is made from nectar, from a bloom and a flower. So whatever is blooming in a particular place at a particular time, that is the potential nectar that's gonna go into the honey. So then the equation is simply, are there bees in the area? Is there nectar available? And is the weather cooperative, which we've had a heck of a time in the last month and a half in my area of the weather not cooperating very well. Um, but the nectar sources that are in a particular area and having the bees in the area is the equation to make honey when the weather fits. All right. So um, next slide, Max. So your location will have sort of a normal pattern of uh, the bee, honeybee year, if you will, right? And you've all experienced this, even if you're a first year beekeeper, you've, you've, you've lived through one season. Um, and so you know the, the progression of the season from coming out of winter to build up and swarm and you know all the, the, the growth in the hives. Um, and then again, that's aiming towards a nectar flow that the bees are anticipating and they're trying to build up the colony strength so that they can make honey. One thing that you need to know and, and tune into is what is that pattern for your particular location? That's why you can see here, this is, these are screenshots from the HiveTrax app um, that a big part of what we are uh, trying to accomplish with the app is to give you context for your beekeeping. So your place, um, that you're located, the terrain in that area, the flora in that area, what's happening in the community in your area are all super important information that you need to know as a beekeeper to know, you know, what's it gonna be like for the honey this year, okay? Um, so one of your jobs as a beekeeper is to understand what those flows are gonna be like in your area. And then again, make appropriate management actions for that. Uh, that pattern in your area. All right, next one, Max. All right, so uh, yeah, so what can you control? We have a little bit of control as beekeepers. That's that's why we're part of the equation and we have management things that we can do. And I would suggest, and, and actually it's, I think it's true that you should have some sort of notion of what's your objective as a beekeeper. You know, uh, here I have honey production you could have honey production from the beekeeper's hat or honey production from the honeybee's hat, okay? The honeybees are producing honey for next winter I mean, and for their own consumption as they're going through their activities. But their goal is to get enough honey for next winter. Now we as beekeepers, if we are wanting to uh, sell honey or just have some honey on the table, share with our neighbors, then we can do things that, that kind of enhance that production. As I said, the bees are going to make honey. If the conditions are there, they will make honey. We can do things that enhance that honey production, if you will. The bees will make as much honey as possible given the conditions, okay? So again, your job as a beekeeper is to tune into that, know what those conditions are and help them make honey. All right, so in the spring, it's, uh, Again, what's your objective, okay? I would suggest if you want more honey, then you don't want your hives to swarm, okay? That's kind of a given. Uh, and so there, we could have a whole 
another webinar or two or three <laughs> on spring management and how to, you know, do swarm management. Okay. Um, but in any case, you're going to need to do something to manage the colonies. They're going to be exploding in the spring. Um, and you want that good, healthy population of your bees, uh, the field force, you want it to be there and to be primed and ready for when the nectar flow comes. If it does, the bees are going to be there to take it. All right. So here, here I have a picture of Sullivan, my son. This is a spring. You can see he's doing splits. And our operation splitting is kind of one of our main methods of preventing swarms uh, to, you know, be ready for the honey production. All right, next one, Max. So clearly you want healthy populations of bees. You want brood patterns that look like this. You want populations in the hives that look like this. Um, and, and so all the normal things that you would do as a beekeeper to help keep the bees healthy, whether that's making sure you've got a, a young, vigorous, good laying queen, they've got sufficient food, if you've uh, coming out of winter with an overwintered hive, do you want to do some sort of mite treatment or did you take care of all that uh, in the fall? I would, I would argue that even if you took care of it in the fall, you might want to at least think about it in the spring. Uh, if, especially if you don't split, that's gonna, the, the mites are going to really get a quick foothold there. Um, and, and so you want to manage for that as well. Uh, or those uh, times in the spring where spring started early, like it did in North Carolina, and then it got cool, making sure that there's enough food in, in the hive to keep them going, keep them happy, keep them growing. Um, all right, next slide. So again, healthy bees uh, primed and ready for the nectar flows when they get there. That's what the bees are trying to do. That's what you want to help them do, okay? Um, and all that's dependent, again, going back to the first slide, where you are, okay? One way that you can know what's going on in your area, and, and I would suggest you do this, is talk to the other beekeepers in your neighborhood, right? That is, is the most effective way of knowing, wow, what's this, uh, what's the nectar flow look like in this area, right? What are the typical nectar sources? All those sorts of questions that you will gain experience with over time, and you'll see the variability over time, but it's going to follow a similar pattern. With one notable exception, with our Australia friend here, um, their nectar flows are, in particular, a little wacky, let's just say, um, and they can follow rain events and, and some trees only flower every three years or kind of weird cycles like that. So there are caveats to everything in beekeeping, right? So what I just said, of course, there's exceptions. All right. So if you're going to make honey, well, you need a place for them to make the honey. <laughs> That's why we have honey supers, right? And there's plenty of debate over what those supers might look like. Are you going to use wax foundation, plastic foundation? Are you going to put starter strips and just let them do natural comb? any and all the above, or forgetting to put frames in a hive if you've ever done that, the bees don't care. They will make wax and they will store honey. Again, they are going to make honey. That's what they do. And they're going to do it regardless of what you do. Okay. So you put enough space in there for them to make honey. Um, in your honey supers, are you going to use shallow, mediums, deeps? Again, all those variables. It doesn't matter really. They're going to make honey. It depends on what you want to do with that at the end of the day. Uh, another, I threw queen excluders in here just if we want to have a debate. Um, that's another debatable topic as well um, that generates a lot of, of conversation. And if you're in honey production, kind of like I am or other bigger producers, uh, the commercials, you're going to use queen excluders just to keep the queen out from laying in those honey supers. And there's some arguments that, oh, it reduces your honey production. Well, my picture there on the right is my counter example to that. This is out of Saskatchewan in Canada. And so there's double deeps and then there's a queen excluder and they've got one, two, three, four, five, six deeps on top of that. So I would, if, if it is reducing the amount of honey they produce, I'd hate to see what they make without the queen excluder. So uh, again, I'm not trying to settle the debate. It just as a management action for us, it's easier to do that way. And you can see in the left-hand picture, the queen excluders in these are all right over the single brood chamber. 
in our operation, we run single deeps. We've done one and a half before, but we're at single deeps right now. All right, next slide. All right, so your bees are healthy. You have honey supers ready. When's the nectar flowing? Again, your friends who've been beekeeping for a long time kind of know when that happens. Okay, if you've never kept bees before, then you don't know. Um, and so how do you know? Well, blooms on the flowers, okay? Well, which flowers? Well, you need to know which flowers or which nectar sources in your area are the most prominent, the ones that are going to produce enough nectar that's going to be excess and give you honey, okay? In these pictures right here, I'm showing you sourwood blooms because I'm in a sourwood yard, and we have trees that we watch for the sourwood um, just to give us an indication of how far along we are in the flow, when it starts, when it's going to end, things like that. Um, but in the hive itself, you can tell things, all right? The, the bees themselves will start being more purposeful in their flights. If you've ever been seen a hive where it's on a really strong honey flow, the bees are, are super active. They are not just coming out and lazing around. They are on a mission going somewhere. So you can just tell from looking at the outside of the hive. Inside the hive, fresh white wax on the edges. Um, actually, Max, go to the next slide. That's, that's where that one is. Um, on the left-hand side, this is, uh, you know, when you pull a frame out and they're clean, and in my case, we try to use drawn comb already, all right, but it needs repairing, so the bees are putting fresh wax on the edges. If you look down in between the frames and you see the white as in that middle picture, clearly things are going on. It's beginning to happen, right, the nectar flow. And then on the right there, this is a little bit of technology in the mix. This is a hive scale. If you're familiar with them, um, you know, this sawtooth shape is what you want to see on a daily flow of the bees. All right. So they leave in the morning. You can actually see the field force leaving. There's certain weight of bees that leave in the morning. And then those start coming back and they're heavier than when they left. They're full of pollen, nectar, water, whatever and they're coming back in, the scale starts going up. And when you're in a flow, your scale looks like this. Each day, you're a little bit more than the day before, okay? And so you're making gains. That means that overall your hive is heavier as you go, and that heaviness is showing up as typically honey in the honey supers, okay? Uh, what else? Um, yeah, that's good on that one. All right, so you've come through the neck or you're in the nectar flow, okay? So you're you're seeing the fresh white wax in your hives. Um, the bees are, are very active and maybe you actually have to add more supers, okay? Um, and that's another, we could diverge into that if you want. Uh, how do you manage the supers on uh, on a flow? Okay, again, there's different schools of thought on it. Uh, we typically try to stay at least two supers ahead of the flow. So give them two supers and we're running shallows or mediums. If you're running deeps, probably just a single deep. Um, and you want to keep your empty comb ahead of the flow itself. Now in your area, you're going to, again, historically have some indication of how strong is uh, our spring flow, right? What do we typically make in our season? Okay. And, and so you will want to have one enough supers in your shed or cleaned up and ready to go as what the typical is for your area. Now, if you go way over that, then maybe you're having to scramble and buy some supers, or if you go way under that, you just don't need them all, but you need to have enough supers that's going to catch all that, the flow that you're expecting for your area. Um, and then the question is, when do you add more supers? So uh, as they are filling up the supers, if if your top super is, you know, half full or beginning to get filled and you know there's more time left in the flow, expected flow, then go ahead and put those other supers. Do you put them on top or do you under super? Again, there's arguments both ways there. We won't get into that. Um, if you're in a operation that's got a lot of hives and you're, you're going to top super pretty much because it's easier. You don't have to lift up all the supers. Um, by the way, how, how, 
how much does a super weigh? Well, that's one of the reasons that beekeepers have bad backs, right? Is is pulling all the honey off the the hives, and your shallow supers are going to be in the probably thirty five pound range, mediums forty five to fifty maybe, and then your deeps are in the eighty pound range, full of honey, and that so that's pretty tough when you're when you're trying to harvest that honey. So when do you harvest the honey? Well, again, what's your no local knowledge? of the flow for your area. You're going to know something about when is it is it typically over, how long does it typically last. Um, and the indicator for the honey itself is, is it capped? Okay, so when the bees remove the moisture from the nectar to make honey, they're trying to reduce that moisture content, as you have all learned, I'm sure, to 18.6% or less. And when they get it dry, they put that cap the wax cap over it, I, I, I describe it as like they've got a little jar of honey in that cell and they're screwing the cap on to preserve that honey, right? So they go across and, and cap it all. Um, and then, you know, when it's capped, it's ready for us to take. You still might want to check the, the moisture. Um, but if the bees say it's ready, then we can say it's ready. Another thing you can do, maybe you've, you've seen this before as well, you can do a shake test. If it's only partially capped, you can take a frame out and shake it with the, the, the comb facing down. And if the, the nectar falls out, then you know it's pretty new nectar and you'll want to let it stay longer to get uh, capped. Okay, But once they're starting to cap it, um, you can see both of these pictures here on the right, I would pull that honey in a second uh if it's you know mostly capped especially if you know center frames are all capped and they're just finishing out the edges things like that um when do you do this well i i the note there says toward the end of the flow um that's true uh most of the time uh again as most things in beekeeping for, for me, I'll pull honey as the flow is going, if it's capped and ready, if I'm wanting to take that honey and go ahead and extract some, say I'm supplying a market or something like that. Um, for as a backyard beekeeper, you know, you can wait till the flow is over. There is an argument for why you would do it before the flow is over, and that's more of the robbiness of the bees. If you've ever uh, pulled honey after the flow is over, and typically after a strong flow, there's going to be reduction in nectar sources. It might not be necessarily a dearth, but there's going to be a lot more bees with a lot more energy <laughs> than there are nectar sources out there. And the bees get, uh, you know, they, they want work to do. And so they're going to be robbing off one another. And, and you can also use that to tell when the nectar flow is over, right? If the bees are robbing or if they're, if you set out a wet super and they don't get on it, the flow's still on. If they get on it, then the flow is and things like that. Um, so next question, how much to harvest and how much to leave the, again, much debate there. The bees themselves need a certain amount of honey for winter. This should again, be a local knowledge. How much honey do the bees typically need for my area? And then are there other opportunities later in the season for the bees to get that honey for winter? Or if I take this honey, am I going to have to feed in the end? Again, so those are management decisions that you can make as a beekeeper. I would, uh, there's a tendency to say, oh, don't harvest any honey the first year, as the question there implies. I would say, man, if you're a beekeeper and you've got a capped frame of honey for certain, take it and enjoy, <laughs> you know, the fruit of your bees and your labor. Um, the the question is just don't strip all the honey off and and then don't think about what the bees need for winter again there's a holistic approach you want to take here of gauging how much honey you want to you're going to take off um it's based on your own needs and the needs of the bees just match those up align them together um what's that last question there i can't see it oh, many different ways to process the honey so now that you now that you have your honey um, there are different ways to get that honey where you can eat it. Okay. Uh, most of us have some sort of extraction, uh, device that we use and, you know, spin the honey out, cut the caps off, spin it out. 
You might do cut comb honey as well. If you've got some natural comb in there, it's always nice to get a nice chunk of comb. Um, if you're a flow hive user, then you've got a different way of getting that honey out. Um, it's going to be like the extracted version of the honey, but it, it comes out of the hive, you know, through the flow mechanism. Um, you might do crush and strain. If you just got a few hives, you're going to crush the wax, strain the honey out. Um, in any case, the byproduct of that process is your honey, right? And your, uh, wax. And both of those are valuable. Don't, don't go throwing away your wax. You'll want to keep that as well, either in the comb, which for honey production, we want drawn frames to go into the hives. That's super important to us as a, as a beekeeping operation. That's gold. That's money in the bank. It's, it's wax that the bees don't have to expend their energy on, right? Um, and so we want to keep that, that comb as intact as possible because you can use it for years and years, literally. Um, if all you're using the, a frame for is for honey production, um, it will last a long time. All right, Max. All righty, then let me uh, take it take it over a little bit here, James, while you get ready and uh, put your yeah. gear on. And uh, then we're going to go open up a hive here. Exactly. So James, as James is getting ready, uh, he had mentioned it already before. So we this this season, if you aren't using it already, we launched an all new app, uh, the new Hive Tracks app, which is mostly catered towards hobbyist beekeepers. So it's the easiest when you handle up to five or six hives per apiary. You can use it with more, but then the the SVU data collection and we do records per hive. It can get a little bit cumbersome if your hive count per apiary is is higher than that. So what I've included here are a few screenshots uh, from the app. On um, the first one to the left is what you will see when you click on the home button at the bottom. You have then three options to directly record an inspection. Uh, there's another webinar that we've done on inspections. So there's a link uh, that you can find there. You can schedule your to-dos, anything you plan to do, which is the middle one. And then on the right is for anything that you record. And as James was saying, much of the recording really takes place to get a better understanding of your season as a beekeeper, because everything that we do, we would like to see it in the flow of the season as like a hive history, right? Everything you record as a beekeeper lands on your hive history, and that allows you to go back in time and see specifically now that the climate can be a little bit off or there can be weather patterns that are different from year to year. So this is where the records come into play and you can go back and see, okay, am I early now compared to last year? Am I sooner or am I a little bit later than last year? And uh, we have taken some of the pictures before, some of the things that you can record are, for example, the flora, in particular to make sure that you know what is blooming and when, because these blooming patterns are the ones that shift the most. And the three screenshots here on the right-hand side are the honey harvest, uh, the honey harvest record. So as, as James was saying, there's always a time and there's always a place. And the place is being recorded when you set up your apiary and your hive in the app. So it's both in terms of the terrain and the environment. So am I in a suburban, urban or rural environment? What kind of terrain am I more in the mountains? My more in a in a in, in in the city or even in an area that could be a forest, and then the location that's the apiary here. I've used my Boone apiary apiary, and then uh, to select a particular hive, you can also select multiple hives if you're harvesting multiple hives at the same time. And um, the related open to do is if you had a to do scheduled uh, and you want to knock that off from your from your to do list, and then. The next question that is asked is the unit that you use. Again, for I'm European myself, so I may go for the kgs here in the U.S. It can be pounds, or even as James was saying, you can go for the uh, for the frame count. So, do you are you taking off the, the small frames, medium frames, deep frames? We have a wide selection of the different items that that happen there, and then for you the ability to enter how much honey you have been extracting uh, in that particular amount. The ability to also add what has been foraged that's really interesting to understand you know what is the key foraging resource or the foraging source that the bees have used and then the ability to add a couple of pictures which also are super helpful again for the comparison specifically in between flows and then season over season year over year and then, then finally any type of notes anything that may have been off or anything you would like to do um to to remind yourself of how um, the the uh, how the harvesting went this time or anything you would like to remind for the next time. 
And that's something I invite you all to try it out. We have a 30 day free trial. There's no credit card required. So you can just try and play around with it. It's a fairly recent launch. So we love hearing the feedback and kind of understanding how you can use it and how you are using it. We will have a QR code here in a minute as well. So maybe I'll pull that one up real quick before I hand it back to you, James. So for the ones of you who want to try it out, it's just to scan the QR code and try downloading the app to get that set up. Again, it's a fairly easy process to get your APRs and Hive set up and then um, to start recording all the data, anything from the normal feeding um, or, or any man management practice. We have one little item that is uh, also for journal entries. So you can really craft the season. You can basically record the story behind the honey that you're being harvested or that is being harvested that you're about to harvest. And I've just heard from James. So he is ready. He is all veiled up. So I would say I'm going to pin your screen here and then take it away, James. I think you're still on mute. Let me just unmute you. Yep. All right. How are we? We are good. Okay. So, hey, again, everyone, let's see uh, what you're seeing. All right. There you go. Okay. So I'm going to flip this around over there is where we were broadcasting from. Uh, here we are in the Sourwood yard. And I'll just say right now, it's, some rain came through last night. The uh, it's not hot enough for me <laughs> or for the bees. Um, they've just begun to start flying this morning, and but we'll we'll pop into one of these hives right over here and take a look. The signs that I told you about, um, the white on the edges, that sort of thing, has not started happening yet. Um, we expect some warmer weather towards the end of this week and it should really turn on then, or we hope so anyway. Right, Robert. Um, and so let me show you another thing right here. Uh, so hive scales, this is what they look like right here underneath the hive. So I've got three scales in, in all of my yards that are helping to monitor, uh, the weight and actually let me share something right here can i share something max i no, maybe not no not this no that, that's fine uh no so i had a, i had a, a screenshot of that but let's pop in this hive over here and i'll show you what's going on this is my lovely assistant oliver in the background here and the sun was out earlier which was making the bees much happier so let's hope they're still okay. And again, you can see, go ahead, Oliver, show the top there. There's not a lot of bees up in the in the top yet. Uh, again, once the flow starts, they will be really strong up here. They're a little bit more in this. And if you look, so the configuration here, if you look, there's a deep, then a queen excluder and then a medium super. They're beginning to work here in the middle. Um, again, if, if the flow was really turned on, which I was hoping it would be, by this date it should have been, right? But if you're in North Carolina or tuning in uh, kind of from the East Coast, you know the last week was a prolonged uh, rainy, it's like we lived in a rainforest um and you know so it wasn't real good for getting anything growing or blooming or, or any of that so there's a little bit of nectar going in right here um yeah you can see it is the right color um for sourwood nectar and this I don't know if this any of these frames have it. Yes, you know how you write a date on your frames for when you know you use them for brood or whatever, or when you put fresh wax in them. Um, these frames in here. Mm, that's good. It is good. Um, 
these frames we've been using probably for 15 to 20 years. Um, and then you just put new, new foundation in. And we talked about that. It could be um, some of these are plastic. Some of these are, are wax uh, foundation. Every once in a while, I'll throw it. If the flow's on really strong, I will put uh, just an empty frame in there so we can get some nice cut comb out of it. But that's that's the unexciting report from the from the sourwood yard today. Um, let me see. Come over this way. Morgan. And Robert was just posting in the chat here, James, that, you know, bees don't, <laughs> bees don't like the cold and neither do the blooms on the trees. When it's hot, bees are more likely yeah. to forage. So in this particular bee yard, and if I had to choose a place for a bee yard, I don't think I would choose this place. It's kind of in a creek bottom. There's a creek right over here. It's very uh, moist and humid. There's pine trees. It's shaded. Again, it's not my ideal version of a, of a bee yard, but historically this location has been our most productive uh, bee yard, sourwood bee yard, despite these kind of things that would indicate otherwise. And this hole right up through the top, point your camera up there, Oliver. So during the, when, when the flow gets going, when it's sunny, there's just like a tornado of bees just going straight out the top of this and then going to we're surrounded by kind of ridges and mountains around here. So the bees are going out to the, to the sourwood uh, trees, which are blooming right now. They're, they're, there's a beautiful bloom going on. So we're just waiting on the weather uh, to cooperate. All right, Max, if you want, we'll go back and do some Q and A. Yeah, absolutely. Let me share here again and uh, go over there. So, please feel free to add any type of questions you may have directly in the chat. Anything you would like to, you would like to know or any thoughts you had or any questions about anything that James mentioned before. Um, anything also, of course, to, to the app or just if you wanna share some things about things you've struggled with during the, during the current flow or what your harvest first harvest feels or felt like, feel free to put that in the chat and we can talk about it. And also just raise your hand, I can unmute you. There we go, let's start. How do you keep all of your hives in the same configuration, James? I'm unmuting you, you should be. Yep. All right, you're in. Okay. How do you keep them all in the same configuration? Uh, well, we don't. Uh, is is the is the uh, real answer to that? We try to. Um, and running single deeps. If if you've watched different YouTube personalities, you've probably seen people talking about running single deeps. Ian, I think, up in Canada does. Um, and so there's certain management that you have to do to kind of keep the the single deep going um and just managing that space well it requires a little finer tuning um but on top of that how many honey supers we we have um totally depends on the bees themselves and how much honey that they're making um and and over the years and maybe you've found this out as well um i pretty much can divide a bee yard into thirds <laughs> A third of the hives will kind of not do much. A third of the hives will do pretty well. And then another third will just go gangbusters. Okay. Um, and almost no matter what we do in try terms of evening up and that sort of thing, sometimes it, it kind of divides out that way. And it certainly will, that will be some of your experience at home. You, if you don't have as many hives, you don't get sort of the comparison. That's one reason you should have at least two hives um, when you're keeping bees in your backyard. It's just so that you can compare um, and see kind of what what should be going on at this time, as well as talking to your friends um, and saying what's going on in the bee yard, uh, what's going on with the flow right now, et cetera. Then we got, All right, yeah, what else? thanks so much. We got two more questions. So uh, one more here. What is the best way to remove bees from frames you are collecting? 
Oh, I, I skipped that completely. Very good. Thank you for that question. Um, and that's one of those that has uh, many different answers. Okay. Um, if you're just taking a few frames, then shaking or brushing the, the bees off, I've found is pretty effective um, and, and is not uh, too burdensome, right? There's no additional equipment really except a brush or a feather or something. Um, and, and then put the frames in something to cover them up, et cetera. So that's one way uh, if you're not doing many, then beyond that, if you're, if you're doing many more hives, then uh, you might use a bee escape. Okay. That's kind of the next kind of, uh, you know, you put the device between the honey super and the rest of the bee, the, the hive and the bees can go out, but they can't get back in. Um, I really like those. They do take an extra step. You have to put them on then wait and then come back, but they are, they are very effective. Um, and, and I like those, they get the, the supers pretty clean in terms of bees. Uh, next from that, it would be a fume board. So you use some sort of uh, kind of felt board, you put it on top. Some of the commercial guys have like a little wind thing that kind of helps uh, push the, the, the fumes down into the super. And you put something smelly on the felt and the bees go away from it. Um, kind of Fisher's Bee Quick is one of the uh, kind of perennial uh, ones there and then there's others that are much harsher chemicals let's say and they they smell horrible um as in like throw up it's it's awful um and then beyond that the next thing is a blower all right so you can set the supers out and blow the bees off with a, a leaf blower or something like that um and we've used all of those at one time or another but that's a great question and thanks, thanks there, James. Then Lou, Lou had a question. I'm gonna unmute you. You should be able to push the button there. Lou. There you go. Hey, thank you. First of all, I want to thank James for my autographed <laughs> bottle of Faith Mountain Sourwood honey that he brought up to New Jersey for us. Now I have two questions. Yeah, I've I've seen on some YouTube videos that some beekeepers put a hole in the top of the honey supers so that it makes it easier for the bees to get in and out. And I've read that, you know, if they don't have to go through the whole hive that they might just deposit the nectar where it's easier in that box. Is that true or? You're asking a beekeeping question. Is it true? That's, that's, oh. that's funny, Lou. Uh, <laughs> it's true for some people. How about that? Um, <laughs> so, uh, we, we've not done that. Um, there, sometimes it's done accidentally. Like if you have a crack or something, you know, the supers don't fit well together. I've also seen some, uh, folks offset the, as you get up in the stack, you offset the upper supers a little bit so that they can come in and out that way. Um, to be honest, I, I don't think it makes a difference in terms of end of the day, how much production you're going to get, or at least not enough to matter. Um, and, and so again, and I, I, again, I don't have a def definitive answer. We don't do that. Um, and those big stacks in Saskatchewan that I was showing you earlier, they don't do that. Uh, so I, I kind of trust the people who make their living making honey. Okay. <laughs> and one other question. Um, I've seen some videos where, like you were talking about, where they put a little twig or something under the top cover so it's easier for e evaporation for the bees? Correct. Yes, we, we do that sometimes. Yeah, if we're towards the middle or end of the flow where it is, you know, the nectar's really coming in. Um, and on those high scales at night, you see a, a, a drop that's vapor water vapor being exited from the hive by the bees and uh if you've been in a bee yard with even a few hives when there's a big nectar flow going on you can hear the bees it's there's just a hum in the yard so that one i do think helps uh facilitate that you know getting the the water vapor out of the hive we don't do it religiously but if we think about it and and we do it Okay, thank you. Looking forward to you coming back up to Jersey soon. All right. 
Thanks a lot, Lou. Any anybody else? Robert just made a little comment here that foragers give nectar to house bees for storage. Right. So there's going to be some transfer of honey from those foragers into the colony itself for further processing before it gets in the honey super. So I don't I don't know if he's arguing for it doesn't matter. They still have to go through the house bees to to get it in or not. But yeah. All right. What else? All right. Yeah, if that is uh, if, if that's it again, we want to be mindful mindful of everybody's time, and we want this to be more conversational and 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 casual for for all of you to ask any questions. We of course leave you with with our email addresses. If there's any any follow up questions, or if you would like to um to to yeah be more engaged or more involved, we also have a new web portal that will be ready soon. So if you'd like to try that out. Uh, that's going to be a big, big opportunity. And then, of course, there is a big reason, you know, the the, the, the beauty, so to say, um, about collecting data on where your honey comes from and where the honey has been produced, ob obviously, is the first step towards proving the origin of your honey. So that's something that um, James and uh, James and I have been working on, on for a long time to look at how can we use data to derive the origin of the honey and showcase that on a honey profile. So that's something we'll be talking about can, more. Can I hey later. let me let me speak to that real quick. Sure. Max. Let's go. Since we've got since we've got a little bit of extra time, um actually this sourwood honey production that this bee yard that I'm in and and I've been doing this sourwood honey for uh about uh 15, 16 years now. So I've been through <laughs> multiple cycles of it. And it's part of my business model as my farm and honey sales um, as part of my son's business model for his his beekeeping operation is to make sourwood honey and sourwood is is one of those high-end varietals you might call it that fetches a higher price per pound than other honeys um, there there's quite a few of those around you know like tupelo honey or you know any kind of varietal will garner a higher price point and sourwood in particular is one that gets um, mislabeled uh, quite a bit. People sell something that's labeled as sourwood that is not sourwood. Um, and, and so it was personal to me <laughs> to come up with uh, a mechanism or to work on a way of validating or authenticating honey. And so this place that I'm at right here is really the driver for a lot of the work that we're doing in honey authentication. And it's really in the best interest of all of us as beekeepers, right, to elevate the authenticity of our own honey. And how better to do that than to capture the information of, around where the honey was made, okay? Going back to my first slides, the honey uh, that's made in a particular location at a particular time, there comes the sun, beautiful. Uh, it makes it unique, right? And so creating sort of a, a fingerprint, if you will, a data fingerprint is what we're after that says this honey was made at this place at this time under these conditions, then attaching that information to the honey and letting that flow through the supply chain so that Lou in New Jersey could hit a QR code on my jar and say, this is where this honey came from and it's validated through these various layers of data, uh, some from the beekeeper, some from the weather, some from the land use in the area, some from scales, uh, all these different elements of data that are gonna come in and identify that honey. And so then when you go to a store and there's a sourwood honey, say from me or somebody who's using this system and there's a sourwood honey that was just posted on a website recently in my town, that was just this vanilla jar of honey that had no other information about it. They just said it was sourwood honey. There's gonna be a difference and we can tell the difference between those two. Um, that's that's the end game for, for us. And for me, again, it's it's personal at this point of, of, of solving this problem. And uh, yeah, we want all of y'all to be, be part of that as well. 
So no, thanks, thanks a lot, James. I already had two. So there was one one question about the next webinar about swarming. So that's definitely on our list. I think that's a that's a great new topic, and also a few questions about further presentations to state clubs and beekeeping clubs. And we're always open and happy to that. So feel free to send sure. us an email. Thanks again, everybody, for participating. Again, we'll be sending out the 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 recording uh, here shortly. Thank you all for taking the time on this Tuesday. You all have a great rest of your day. And we look forward to seeing you in the app and on further webinars. Y'all take care. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you all. There was Fernando. I saw him. <laughs>